uh, continue with our sequencing in learning about counseling and the different stages in a session. Um, last um, uh, symposium, we learned about the importance of um, listening and the, and the listening skills and the multiple factors that are included in the process. Um, so tonight, we are going to take what we learned previously and uh, try to infuse it in what um, a, a counseling session may look like. I want to emphasize the idea that what I'm going to present tonight is just a framework that you can use as a reference, not the truth. Everyone has special skills and qualities that are to be taken in consideration when working with other individuals. So consider the presentation today as just another way of seeing um, that is helpful, it's quick and allows to, to run a session. Um, we are going to exemplify. I will invite everyone to ask questions and, and, and continue the, the interaction with us as, as we continue and move forward. Oscar will help me monitor those uh, Q&A and, and if you have any comment, please feel free to do that. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, we got you. Beautiful, thank you. So as I was saying today, I wanna to present in five stages of the counseling session. Once again, this is a framework of reference. This is not the truth. This is just a way of, of supporting your process um, as it's helpful, it's direct, it's easy to follow. As you continue developing your skills, you, you will encounter yourself modifying it um, as, it fit, uh, as it best fits the need of your own clients. Um, but for today, that's what we are going to be learning. So any question before we start? Back to me. And to me as well. No, beautiful. Um, those are our driving. Please drive carefully and uh, feel free to listen to um, the presentation only. And let's begin. So our last session, we talked about the importance of the, our listening skills. Among those listening skills, if you remember, we included attending behavior, observing behavior. Um, today, we are going to be adding the, uh, the use of open-ended question, the use of close and the question, encouraging, paraphrasing, reflecting, and summarizing. Although I want to bring your attention to those last ones, encouraging, paraphrasing, reflecting of feelings, and summarizing as not to be the focus of tonight's work, but truly that will be the next symposium and sequence of our entire process because those are skills that are the deserve. Um, uh, very uh, independent skills, um, independent skills, sorry, independent time, because we need to dig into that in a very profound way. But today we are going to engage in how to, to frame a session, utilizing our previous learned um, listening skills with the attending and observing behavior as a way to support a process. Okay, so does anyone remember why is it, why was it important to listen or any previous recalls from our presentation last time? Hey, you guys are welcome to uh, type in your chats. If you have a, a little bit longer message you'd like to share, you can raise your hand and we'll live speak. Mm -hmm. And sure, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not uh, testing anyone. For sure, everyone is tired and uh, Yes, absolutely. Help the client to open up. That's a very important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. True. Um, do you guys remember um, the two ways that we uh, listened, the two manifestations of the listening to build our rapport? Mm -hmm. Very important. Eye contact, beautiful. 
So everyone has a beautiful idea of what we um, have shared with you guys last time. Remember that also we talk about a an inner process and an outer process when we are engaging with a client and building our report, meaning I'm also listening to me, to myself, to my inner thoughts, to what is happening. That's dynamic. Thank you, Michelle. It, that's absolutely true. I need to be aware of what's happening inside of me so that I can actually pay attention to what is coming to me from my client. Very, very important. This is super important because as I mentioned, it builds up on what is gonna happen today. Let me start advancing. So today I am bringing a five stage of counseling for a framework. This doesn't mean that it is the truth, it's just a way, okay? So one of the first things we are going to be noticing is that we need an empathic relationship. Of course, then we move into the story and the strengths of the individual. And I will walk through all of them one by one and exemplify how does it look like and what we are looking for in each of those stages. Then of course, the process also includes the setting up of goals. Um, another very important phase or stage is the restory or the retelling or the recoding or the recreation of a new narrative, if you want to call it that way. And then the action taking or the enactment of action. This is a very um, straightforward process that I'm presenting. Once again, once you start developing your skills as counselors, you will see the building of a relationship may take a long period of time then you probably will um, acquire the information you get um, as you move forward for, or from the story of the client, including the, the client's strengths, challenges, uh, problem uh, uh, that they are coming to you for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in, in a way of summarizing, those are the five stages that I would like to cover today for you so that you can actually run a session if you want with those um, uh, um, um, simple steps, which is still very essential um, because truly empathic relationship is what makes the difference. So um, creating the, that the alliance with your client. So let us start. Um, one of the first things that um, we encounter in therapy or, or when we reframe a session or the first session or when you see the client for the first time is truly to begin building up a, an empathic relationship or what is known in counseling as creating alliance or what is typically known also as building a rapport. You want to create a positive relationship with your clients through an empathic modality. So I know we have spoken um, in, in the previous symposium about what empathy is, but I would like to challenge you today a little more to begin um, sharing, if you wanna type or raise your hand, whichever you wanna do, what is empathy? We keep talking about empathy. We keep talking about how we need to be empathic, how we need to build up a relationship, how we need to be uh, um, um, accepting of a client. But what is it to you? How does it look like? How does it feel like to be empathic? And then for there are more questions and I'm just gonna throw them there so that you can begin um, sharing with us. Can I be empathic all the time? in the session, while I'm in the session, what are some of the elements that may interfere with my um, empathy when I'm with someone? Um, it's empathy equal to self-awareness or is self-awareness of my persona an enhancer or a catalytic for my empathy? Thoughts, I will be reading, fantastic. Understanding how someone feels. Allowing, the, you, allowing yourself to feel what the client feels. Beautiful. You cannot be em empathic all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Understanding how someone is feeling. Trying to understand what the client is going through. Mm -hmm. Understanding what others are feeling also able to read. Uh -huh. Someone as well. Put yourself in their shoes. Uh-huh. Uh, this, this is interesting. Understanding the feeling of another person and to react appropriately. Uh -huh. 
interpreting and respond to the emotions of others. Aha. Uh -huh. Imagine yourself in someone else's shoes. Imagine. Mm -hmm. Ima empathy is not understanding what someone feels, but understanding why they feel the way they feel. How powerful. And I don't know if you, you notice, but in all of your answers, there is this um, idea of perception. I'm going to perceive how the other feel. I'm going to interpret the other. I'm going to attempt to put myself in the shoes of the other. I'm going to understand the other so that they can express their feelings. And then I'm wondering if the empathy is truly putting yourself in the shoes of the other or allowing the other to manifest as he or she is. What happens to you, to yourself? Can you be empathic to yourself while allowing the other to manifest their pain? Having empathy is a share feeling of someone, sharing one direction, or can I share from me to the client? We, in, um, in our field of counseling, are trained to believe that we must be uh, um, 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 mature, solid in order to support others. But um, last week, I encounter a new client and during the first session, I was crying and it was the very first one. So of course, you know, this presentation came handy because then I started thinking, do I look for the client to understand me or I'm just truly allowing myself to manifest to the self of the other who is in front of me? How does it feel and look like, or how did it feel to me in that moment? It felt like a profound solitude inside that came out in the form of tears. My entire body engaged into it. And it's very exhausting. That is why our work as a therapist is not easy because it exhausts your energy. Um, because it is energy that is manifesting when the connection really manifests. So what I wanna say about empathic relationship is truly the application of what we learned before. When you are in connection with your emotions while allowing the other to tell his or her stories, what truly manifests is a report or an energetic connection with the other because you are seeing and, approx and, and approaching or getting, near, or getting near to the other lived experience. So when I'm in my chair and the other one is in front of me, that space gets reduced so much that I can sense the other. And in order for me to experience that, I must be present. Hence, the understanding of what it is to, to hear myself in the moment, to sense uh, what is happening inside of me physiologically and emotionally as well, or cognitively speaking, what is happening in my head? What ideas do I have? And simultaneously being present for the other. This is when empathy uh, um, comes, uh, becomes um, a lived experience. Very hard to define because it goes beyond a, 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 um, a lexic definition of the, a lex, I don't know, I'm, I'm creating a word today, lexotic definition of the word. I don't know if that's a word or not. Lexicon, you were close, you were real close. <laughs> there you go. I tried to actually change it into a verb. My apologies. That's a Spanish <laughs> trick, huh? <laughs> it doesn't work. True. So 
um, it becomes a much more intense when we start living the living the experience of what it is to be empathic. Hence the importance of us to actually being present in the session. Now, when do we start being empathic? When the client walks through my door and sits down? What do you guys think? When do we start with our empathy? There's a question from Timothy. Um, what is the extent of our empathy? And is, is too much empathy harmful? So Carl Jung, uh, he posits this question that we're, we're, well, trying to understand one another, we are taking on the mental activities and emotional activities of the other in some form or fashion. And much later, of course, we've proven that there are what we call mirror neurons in, in the prefrontal cortex that allows us to experience not just empathy in terms of um, through a narrative, through conversation, but visually too. If I see someone hurt, I, I, I feel their pain to some degree. I might grab my hand if I see somebody's hand being struck, or you might do this when you watch horror films, you know, you, you start to feel it. And so we are programmed, we are gen, you know, genetically um, expressed as, as, uh, as, an, as a way of helping to understand and, and communicate with each other. And Jung said that there's this, there's this line, this tipping over point that um, kind of protects you from falling into their world, you know, lest you, you, you indulge in folly ado, which is the, 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 the madness of two, these two being lost within each other's world. So there is a limit and that you don't want to over-identify with the client. If you find yourself doing that, that might be, have more to do with your own experience than theirs. Um, and of course, we don't want to empathize continually um it would like uh, as dr one said it would be completely exhausting and a number of you have mentioned that also i'll let you answer the rest of that question and, and then of course uh, timothy we 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 have seen and it has been researched that there um are individuals that are highly empathic um the highly sensitive uh, individuals um i forgot the um the acronym for that high H S A individuals that will just have more um, sensitive than others, not in the wrong way, but just more in tune of what is happening in their surrounding. Yeah, and that could be helpful too. I, I I would say you know I've had a lot of people say I'm so empathic I can't stand to be in the you know presence of people who are upset or anything like that. And what I would say is that we are all capable of learning emotional regulation emotional awareness and emotional regulation. So if you want to go into this field, it's, it's important that while we we engage in the other person's emotion through an, an, an empathic um, way, we can still come back to our own center and, 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 and be grounded. We don't have to go, you know, you don't have to go. It's like watching a scary movie and then, you know, being scared the rest of the week or something like that. And I would tell folks that, that you want to, um, develop those skills that you can regulate your emotions. A lot of times people uh, will say, you know, I, I have anger management issues or something like that. And that, first of all, it doesn't exist as a diagnostic disorder. And what I would say is more likely is that you're unable to regulate and or appropriately cope with a given situation. And that's what you go to. Um, and this is, we see this very often with folks who are struggling with different um, psychopathologies, but uh, I don't like that term because it doesn't offer a way out. It's just a state of, I am this way. And I, and it's almost kind of, um, it's like a, it doesn't, it doesn't provide an opportunity for the person to grow from that. Just like, this is what I am, you know. And, and Oscar mentioned a key element in all these uh, folks. The idea that I can actually come back to myself to be present for the other. So what I'm advocating for uh, right now is for the allowance of the experience to manifest while you sustain yourself present. It's not that you will enter, um, you will seek, build, and report through an empathic relationship while you will be suffering because then it turns into it is a therapist indeed and one that needs support. So we want to always 
be in touch with that. So um, once again, just wanted it to make, make it clear, I'm advocating for allowing the experience to manifest, you feel it and you come back to yourself so that you can continue supporting the other in front of you while continue receiving the stories, okay? So I will invite you, however, to continue reflecting about empathy. It's, it's a beautiful way of uh, thinking of our profession. <laughs> so part of, um, uh, part of being empathic to the other situation is indeed um, um, building up, but that's the objective, right? Building our report and structuring the session in a way that would allow us to connect with the other. So um, things that may be happening through a narration of the challenge or the reason why someone is coming to see you could be referred to as the topic of the session, um, the story of the session, the feelings that the client is having about the challenge, the ideas that were be, uh, in, in place of the client's the thought process before actually coming to see you. Um, and then it also engaged into, am I understanding what the client is sharing to me? Am I present? What do I think about the client? Even when I pick up, when I pick up the phone, what did I thought, what did I, what did I think about him or her? Does it sound like a challenging client? And then it formulates ideas for me because, um, even when we pick up the phone to support someone or to schedule an appointment, um, or even someone that comes to your agency that is needing of support, even as a case manager, if someone walks into your office, the looks, their, uh, the, the, their appearance, um, the way they walk, it all formulates ideas. In order to build up a relationship, we must let me cancel the word must. We ought to look for uh, ways of understanding what's happening to me in order to enhance the relationship with whoever is in front of me. That is building rapport and restructuring the session or framing the session in a particular way. So one of my first questions, for example, when I pick up the phone is to ask, how can I help? And immediately the clients will actually begin telling you, this is what's happening to me and this is what I need help with. And of course we begin making notes and then we begin processing it cognitively. Can I help? Is it something that I feel comfortable with? Um, and then you start deducting that based on the way in the way you are processing whatever the client is telling you, even at the phone in, in a phone call, it's actually going to enact a particular way of building a rapport with that client. So the, the, the idea um, that I'm trying to convey here is even in the pickup of the phone, even when the client is crossing the door, we are already engaging into building a rapport. It all depends on what's happening to you how you are looking at the client, how the voice sound. Remember that all those are elements that begin enacting a particular attitude inside of you that comes from your ideas about the tone of voice, about the color of the skin, about the hair, about the, wear, the, the, the dressing, about even the way they say hello to you or good morning to you. Um, for me, for example, I have had clients that are constantly emailing saying I need a session I need a session that says a lot to me so when I call them I start building up relationship by understanding that there was an immediate need that was happening and my client was in, in challenge um, at times um, what I ended up doing is allowing that self-regulation as Oscar mentioned um, and, and I don't answer I take my day and then the following day, I will uh, I will either reply to the to the email, or reply to the voicemail, because it allows the opportunity for the client to calm down, so that when I call, they can begin sharing in a more um, calmer manner, if that makes sense. Yeah, we cannot take on the role of emergency services. 
it's important. Some therapists will not have those, what I would say, healthy professional boundaries, and they'll they'll respond to their, their clients. And then this creates kind of a codependency or a, um, a secondary uh, emotional response, which is like a conditioned response, which isn't good because they're looking for you to solve their problems and you're doing it. So then you become this uh, rescuer. And of course, we cannot serve that role, especially since we have so many patients. That might be different in, a, in an interpersonal relationship to some degree, especially with a child or somebody that needs, uh, you know, support in that way. But it can even become um, overly pronounced in interpersonal relationships, like in coupling and families, where the other the others aren't given the opportunity. And you see this failure, you know to launch in children or adolescents and young adults because their parents are overly uh, involved and, and resolving problems for them. So we honor and respect the autonomy of our clients and we, we ensure that we're not engaging in unhealthy behaviors and dynamics that are going to enable them to continue that behavior. And, and of course, we set this up in the outset, we are not emergency services. If you're in a, a, a desperate crisis and you need immediate assistance, you want to call 911. We're not set up for that. I know, I know therapists have done things like that, went, picked up their client, and it ends badly. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen. They could be under the influence of drugs or alcohol. They could bolt out of your car in the middle of the street, in the middle of traffic. And now what are you going to do? You can't just chase anybody down. We're not, we're not police officers, we're not paramedics, we're not, we don't have restraints, we don't have those facilities at our disposal. So it's best to leave those things to the folks that um, are trained and able to respond to those crises. Uh, I, I can understand as a human being wanting to help somebody who's in need, but we have to have a consistent and healthy uh, boundaries in place in order to meet the needs of our patients consistently our, and ourselves, because we, we have our own needs to adhere to, to. Absolutely, and just to piggyback on that, Oscar, um, the idea of, uh, as you say, building up those healthy boundaries even from the beginning. And you may encounter many of your future clients, they will absolutely outreach you uh, for an immediate response. When you encounter that, delay the gratification, delay the response. They will come down and they will stop. And then when you call them, you will see that happening. Um, that they're, that they're more tranquil and at peaceful response. So Tapata, great question. Um, how do we back off from a client that using us to crunch? Um, um, I know that probably your need right now is for me to, um, to give you the tips of how to do this. But I wanna ask you first, have you addressed this with your client? Have you talked to your client about how you feel in the session by constantly attending to his or her needs, whatever, whoever the client is for you? Because when we start actually answering that question, and if it is us, the one that is not bringing or making the elephant in the room visible, then the clients have nothing to do with it. You as a professional need to bring that up so that you can assist the client in understanding what's happening and you raise awareness. Look, this is how I observe your behavior and this has been my experience through the uh, 20 years that I have been supporting you. So it is a time for me to wake up and say, hey, you know, I am, I noticed that this is a, uh, we meet daily, but the, the session has turned into kind of a, 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 a chit-chatting moment for you. Tell me what are you gaining out of that? And you will probably be surprised that to hear that even that conversation may, res it's, it's positive. So the idea of um, I see my client as, uh, uh, using us as a crunch, or is it that I'm defining my client like that, or is it truly that that's what's happening? And when we encounter this idea of truly, it requires for you to know the other side of the story. And that information can only come from your client. So I, I hope that what I'm sharing welcomes you to begin reflecting on, hmm, if 
I categorize my clients like that, is it possible that I am functioning like that? And if I'm looking for the change to occur, do I need to stop being a crutch? Just a couple thinking there. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, I, I, I lost myself on the text, so I don't know where are we, but um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna read as I continue advancing because there are four more um, faces that I wanna cover. Yeah, Felicia's got a big question that we could maybe yes, address. Yes, um, we'll, we'll go back to that one. Um, um, I, I, I see that, okay. Um, so very interesting. Um, and you probably will know me by now. I love linguistics and the function of the language. So of course I needed it to go back to the roots of the language, the report, and I'm sorry, the word report and all that. And I, I encountered something interesting. Um, a part of it, a porter, which is actually from the Italian, uh, from the Latin and then Italian, later Italian, defines us to bring. So when I build up report, it also, um, it, it creates this idea of what is it that I am also bringing into the relationship in order to create this harmonious, mutual understanding and an empathic dynamic. Hence the importance of understanding truly what is happening inside of you, because you are bringing that into the dynamic with the other human being. And only through the understanding of what is happening inside of you, the report can be enhanced. Almost as if you function as a catalytic, almost as if your self-awareness function as a catalytic in the dynamic of building a report and creating alliance with the clients. And, and right now, I want to ask a question to Mr. Sita. Would you say, uh, Oscar, that the, um, kind of a, one of the essential elements in the therapeutic work is the relationship with a client? Yeah, that's the, that's the bedrock of the relationship. Without the relationship, well, there is nothing to, to, and as we talk about different things, the strength of that relationship can really tell you how far um, and how deep you can go with the client. Because there are times where I have thoughts about questions I like to ask and I'll, 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 I'll say, you know, that maybe needs to wait until we've developed um, a stronger, healthier connection that can tolerate difficult questions. Now, a lot of times people would think, well, I'm just gonna be real and tell people how it is. Well, that's not helpful. And so if, if you're doing something for your own kind of, that's how I roll, you know, instead of maybe what's helpful to the, to the client and to the therapeutic relationship, um, you wanna think more in those terms. And to kind of touch on Felicia's question, which is a lot, we're not gonna be able to answer that. It's too, it's, too, it's too specific. And I wouldn't wanna even answer it because it might lead you to interact with that client that way. But one thing to think about is, uh, what uh, autonomy, as I mentioned, um, and all these other um, ethical guidelines that we try to adhere to, to the best we aspire to, the best we can, that you have to balance them with, with, within one another. They, they exist in a constellation of um, attitudes and values, and so not one trumps the other. So when we talk about autonomy and we talk about, you know, young people, yeah, we want to we want to give them autonomy, but you also have autonomy as an individual, and you wouldn't let somebody trample all over your individual autonomy just to just to um, afford them theirs. So it has to be looked at in terms of, uh, I guess, the balance of those those values and attitudes. And, and I want to add to Felicia. Um, I just read during your text. Uh, um, one of the things that you are doing fantastically and beautifully is asking questions to your colleagues. That's what you always want to do. This almost sounds like an ethical dilemma. Mm -hmm. So when we run into ethical dilemmas and challenges, we must consult. Consult, consult, consult. That's, <laughs> That's the key. Oh, yeah. Because remember, if we are five in our team, and we all decided that that young adolescent has the right to direct the treatment. It's five experts saying so. 
versus yeah. you coming up, coming up and say, this is what we are going to do because I decided it. So always, always consult and you are doing that and it's beautiful. So uh, this is kind of a beautiful teachable moment for everyone. Consult, consult, consult. Always with your supervisor. That's why uh, those in intern, um, there are interns have supervisors. That's why we as counselors have colleagues. That's why we have supervisors and, and, and people to bounce back and forward in our, in our questions and treatment. So beautiful. Um, I, I want to thank you for bringing this topic because it's very important that we, we always keep in mind we are not alone. I can call my professional organization that I'm part of, I can call my teacher, my professor, my supervisor, whoever is involved in the case. You are not alone. So thank you. Um, so of course, building um, um, an empathic relationship has a structure. So we want to bring um, the client to how the session looks like. Look, you know, we are going to be sitting here for 15 minutes. My entire goal for today, and I, uh, you know, I'm inviting you to do, is to obtain information in order to support you the best I can, and to even know if I can support you. I mean, you know, it's 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 good to know the information. So, we start framing the session after we have, you know, uh, come uh, empathically to the client. We listen. We want to actually frame it in a way that flows. You know, tell me what are you here for? What's the challenge? How can I support you? So that the client know, explain the forms. Of course, you know, you need to sign the release uh, consent of information uh, of treatment. Those are the reason why I will break up confidentiality and all the basic steps of our counseling process, legal steps, I would say, and ethical steps as well. So it helps us to frame and provide a structure necessary within the empathic build in building up an empathic relationship with the client because of course it, it, it taps into this idea of you are an autonomous being you can walk out of my office whenever you want you know unless of course you're going to hurt yourself you are not going nowhere right so uh, keep that in mind the next thing um, which you know connects beautifully to the next one is that the story and the strength that the client is bringing back to you. And, and when I talk about this story, it's easy to fall into this idea of what's the problem, right? But the problem is what I call the surface. I wanna hear how did everything start it? When do you start feeling in that particular way? Um, who was involved in what? So you start indeed becoming this beautiful researcher that was collecting information, super needed. You need the information, otherwise it doesn't function, right? So, and then you start using your skills to create this beautiful environment in which you can ask direct question with an ended open question. So what's your name, right? And then move slowly to a very narrative process so how did it feel to you when um, uh, you, you found your son using marijuana, for example? And then they open up. So all this, it's encapsulated with your previous skills. Am I listening? Am I asking the questions that will give me the information I need in order to understand what the challenge of the concern is, the, the concern of, uh, of the, the, that they are consulting you for? Am I noticing the client crying? I'm noticing, is it that I'm present to see and observing what the client's behavior is, verbal, no verbal, all that we learned last time. And of course, this trend comes in the very own independent um, slide, which I will show you in a minute, because it's super important to me. So of course, the story, the facts, what, the how, the why, the how much, the how many times, for whom is that happening? With whom is that happening? So all these questions are necessary for you as, as a counselor or as a case manager or, or as a service provider to obtain in order to help the individual. So the story itself, while it can be very factual, it also carries some with the individual, um, gets attached to the, gets the emotions of the individual attached to it. You want to pay attention to that as well. 
okay? Because it's super important. But once again, I, I created this presentation for all of you as to imagine that this is our very first session. This is how we are going to frame it. This is how I develop empathy. This is how I connect. Those are the questions I'm asking in the first session. And then I wanna hear what the client has for him or herself. Meaning, what are the resources of the client? Does the client has friends? What are the multiple intelligences of the client? Qualities, social network or social of support. What's the emotional presence of the client? What emotions are manifesting? Can I notice any personality traits? Look, I name it this purposely strengths because everything that the client brings to you are qualities of the client. I'm not trying to fantasize to say, so if the client has all those qualities, including the challenges, why is the client visiting us, right? What I'm trying to do is to welcome you to begin seeing the potentiality of the client, even at the face of the challenge. Because if you cannot see them or ask for them, the client is not gonna be able to. So you are the one with the magnified glasses in order to begin observing even at the first session. If I can get one element out of you, it will be beautiful. So um, a parent comes to you and say, I am a hard worker, I provide everything to my kid, but then my kids are using marijuana and I don't know what the hell to do anymore. My life is a disaster, but he's already telling you, I'm a hard worker. I don't know you, but that's a quality for me that I write down in my little notebook. Why? Because we are gonna go back to it, maybe not in the first session, but later on. All those qualities will be useful for you to build up um, and, 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 or, to, or to facilitate the client to enact an action. Yeah, you're really trying to get to know the client to, and not assume things like, oh, because based on, I think I know you, or gee, if my kid was doing marijuana, I'd be so pissed off. You must've been really angry. This is not you listening. This is you interjecting your own values, your own thoughts, your own reactions, and your sympathy, but not your empathy. And there's a big distinction there because sympathy is almost uh, pity and where empathy is, is a profound understanding. It's, it's so important that we, we because the, our brain is kind of wired to fill in gaps when there's no information. This is why there's so many conspiracy theories. Um, and, 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 and this usually comes from people who don't spend the time to educate themselves in a, in a, in a way that, um, that we examine facts and information that is uh, vetted. This is, one of the, this is one of the wonderful things about academia is that we, we ask people, criticize my work. Where is where does my scientific rationale fail? Where are my blind spots and my assumptions? So I can go back and rework it. Uh, Dr. Wentz Munoz found this out uh, all too clear when he defended his dissertation. And uh, this is a years long process where your research is constantly critiqued and uh, rejected and then <laughs> resubmitted and improved upon and reworked. And this is a very arduous process. But what it does is it keeps people um, honest, not just with, so we present useful scientific valid information, but um, we, 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 we learn um, of our own biases in, in through that process, which can be very helpful. And, this, and, and to some degree, we do this as therapists, where we're validating the client's experience, but we're also helping them compare that and discern that between other experiences and, and shared reality. And then, you know, say, where, where's the rationale that you're a bad parent? Where, where's the, where's the evidence that you're a bad parent, you know, and things like that. And this, anyway, what, uh, what Dr. Wentz was alluding or made the statement of fact of was that it's so important that we point out those little details and we pay attention so that later on we can use them as a means of letting them know, I know you. I, you've, because you've told me this, not because I think I know you, 
but I know you because, and then that creates a really solid founder. And people are really surprised how much you do understand them. And then of course, it gives you opportunities for, for greater awareness and deeper understanding. Because people can't do it alone. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Absolutely. Super necessary. That is why I do invest a lot of energy in paying close attention to what they are saying. And when, whenever the story or elements of the story indicate strengths, I make a note because it's super useful when we actually advance to the goal settings. So goal settings is always aligned with the client mutually defined because of course they are looking for your support so you are there to support that goal setting but it is always the client desires um, uh, um, wishes desires needs goals that we always take in consideration yes in your mind you may be thinking well i don't think that um, uh, developing a plan for self-care is what you need. Instead, I, I want to develop a, a goal in self-awareness where you become aware of how you are sabotaging yourself. Well, that could be your idea, but the client is not there. Can I actually create objectives within that goal so that we can develop awareness? Yes, we can. That's when the mutual agreement comes handy. We work together always aligning ourselves to the client, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Remember also, the goals can be short and long-term ones. If the client wants to learn how to dance and, and, and it's, it's um, I don't know, a tango, it, it probably will take more than three sessions, right? It probably will take months. So, but the, the good thing is that you go back to the qualities and you start thinking, Oh, he told me he's a good salsa dancer. Maybe what I think is going to be a long-term goal is going to be a short-term goal for him. And how did I get to the conclusion? It's because I was paying attention to his qualities when he was telling me his story. Then I can go back to support my client in goal settings. What do I mean when I actually uh, say mutually deciding those goals? Is when you as a counselor, become actually, you ask questions, you listened and you produced. Very simple. I ask questions to doubts that I have in order to the goal setting. I listen to what the client is telling me or has told me and I produce a plan. Hey, what do you think about this goal? Many of the clients will come to you and say, I am depressed and I want to stop feeling depressed. Good, now I have to interpret what it means to not be depressed. So I will ask you questions. How do it will look like to you when you don't feel depressed? Well, I will move out of the bed. Okay, good, what else? Uh, I will walk my dog. Okay, fantastic, what else? Well, I would like to do, uh, I will do my homework, beautiful. So now we have concrete ideas of how we are going to measure our, our strategies to support the client to reach that goal. So you become the, 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 the investigator, you listen with all the skills that we have reviewed previously, and then you interpret to create a, 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 a goals that align with the client. What do I mean by align with the client? That's the balance. The treatment plan, the goal setting must always incline to the client. You as a therapist, begin asking yourself, how can I engage? How can I support? How can I facilitate? And then the client is like, well, you do this and you do that. And I have supporters. Um, I have high levels of satisfaction in my life. Um, I have great awareness, or maybe I don't have great awareness. Then you kick in and say, well, um, this is a, a facilitated process. Let's, let's develop awareness as an objective of your main goal, which is not feeling depressed anymore. So I have encountered in my life many treatment plans and I love when the treatment plans say, feel um, learning coping skills to, 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 to overcome depression. Mm -hmm. Great, I mean, it's not a bad um, goal, but I would like to hear how we are gonna reach that. Yeah, through measurable goals um, and they should be time limited too in terms of acquisition. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it and, and we cover a lot of this in it. Uh, uh, Intro to Counseling, HMS 101 and 102. 
And then of course, in the bachelor's program, we go on to that, to develop that even further. Absolutely. So every time that you work with a client and you're creating goals, those um, students of mine that are in internship and they ask you to create a treatment plan. And if you use the treatment plan actually leading to you because you are creating a treatment plan, go back and ask, is this all right? Double check, triple check. Because if you work with a client in, in, in case management and you create a goal of help because the client needs to exercise three times a day and then the client comes and say, well, yeah, I exercise three times a day, but guess what, I eat McDonald's every day. Well, maybe the objective for that goal is not to exercise, but kind of a, indeed, it's a smart goal, Savannah, excellent, yeah, we will create that. Now, I. I I don't want you to think that we must um, have a specific outcome all the time because the therapy process, the therapeutic process and counseling, it's a little more, much more than that, but it's always good to have uh, that in mind, kind of a, an outcome so we can follow through. Um, the next phase, restore this is one of my favorite parts of the entire process because through awareness, through facilitating self-awareness in our client, and that self-awareness is reached through when the relationship is strong, of course, confrontation, checking out incongruences in their stories, inner conflict or, or dissonance that they are experiencing. When you bring that to life, what is created in the client is their, his or her ability or their ability to see a new way to their problems. This at, at, at a neurological level, it's nothing but the connection of the, the connection, recognition and creation of new neural paths. That's when the client increases his, her, or their resources to see the problem much more in a much more ample and vast way. So what they saw as my son is smoking marijuana, and then the, the client tells you, I used to, and then you bring it up and say, well, you know, you told me you actually smoked marijuana before, I'm, I'm curious to see what will be the difference with your son now, so that you can see the incongruencies between the story. Then the client may come up and say, never thought about that one. What you are doing in that moment is facilitating awareness so the client amplifies the worldview and begin enhancing acceptance. Just a little example. When this is manifesting, Fox, what we create is a retelling of the story. It's a process, a cognitive process that happens inside of them in their beautiful heads and minds in which they start re-encoding the story. I can continue fighting with my son or I can love my son and build up the trust with him so he doesn't go at night and smoke and drink I would rather have him trust me and say, I'm just going to have a joint. Okay, cool. Because the idea is, can I amplify the way I'm seeing my problem? Can I retell this story? Can I reinvent this story? Can I recode my story? Can I be creative in the way I'm looking at life? That, and then of course, once the client, it's, enact in this way of, of seeing the challenge, what we want to do is actually create an action that will be long lasting. One of the things that I love telling my clients when they come to session is this, and, and I love doing that. Um, they always ask me, so how many sessions do I need to come and see you? And I always answer the same way. I don't want to see you for 10 sessions. I, I really don't. So I trust that in three sessions, you will be fine. <laughs> Why? Um, I know I, I have colleagues that will disagree with that answer, but truly what we are doing is trusting the client, it's telling the client, you're perfectly fine. We are going to work through it. And usually what happens, um, folks, is that I keep seeing them for months. And then one day they say, I'm, I'm okay. I don't want to see you anymore. Okay, fine. Not a problem. 
And then of course, two months later, they're like, can I just do a check-in with you? Yeah, perfect. But what is happening there is the action. Meaning while we facilitate the risk, telling the story, amplifying the view, changing the worldview, what we are welcoming is, can you use your skills for further challenges? And how do we do that? I ask um, imaginary as an areas. So now that we have work with your son and the, the smoking of marijuana, what will happen if your daughter gets pregnant? Oh my God, I don't want to think about it, but you know what? Eh, it may happen. That is an extension of a skill that is being reflected even in an imaginary cases. And of course, um, what our goal is to, it's to facilitate the learning of the client to utilize the resources they have. So what resources? Um, I, I work with many Latino clients. So in, in the Latino community, going into a therapist is kind of a they no no steal. Uh, so when, you know, when I ask this type of question, so if your life face, you know, brings a challenge to you again, what would you do? Well, I will look for help if I need to. Then what we are doing is breaking the stigma of I'm a Latino and I cannot go to see a therapist because I'm not local. And truly what it is, is like, I just need to clarify my idea. So I'm going to come to you or to anyone else, as a matter of fact. Those are beautiful indications that the client is gonna take action when, the, when challenges come handy again. Does it mean that they go forever with the skill and they don't need anything else? No, of course not, because we are constantly changing folks. If we say that with one uh, Tylenol, your headache is gonna go away and then you will never experience that one ever, ever again, that's lying. <laughs> so this is the same in therapy, we grow, Life brings new challenge, they come, they learn new skills, they amplify even more their view, and then they go in their way. So what we have then, once again, this is a framework of, uh, of a five stages of counseling session. We start with our empathic relationship, of course, always. We hear the story, we identify the strengths, do not forget that. Because we as humans are, uh, are tempted to always look in the negative, the weaknesses. Oh my God, oh no, he cannot regulate. Oh my God, he's crying. Oh my God, a lack of emotional maturity. Change your, uh, reframe your mind. Begin noticing, of course, don't ignore the challenge, mm -hmm. but become, uh, but, 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 but start, start looking into those qualities. What do you have in your life? I and there's such a it's just an amazing thing that happens when you point out people's strengths and you capitalize on them, is they act accordingly. And if you point out their negativity, they they act accordingly. So we get to to create uh, a space that you decide what is it you're going to want to do, and that and of course for the the well being of the client. We're going to want to, uh, you know, highlight those strengths so they can believe in themselves instead of doubting themselves. They're, they get enough criticism from themselves and people in their life. We don't really need to add to that. But, um, we want to challenge it because sometimes it's an unrealistic point of view of the individual. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, that, that's beautiful. Thank you, Oscar. So uh, indeed, Timothy, an action is a form of creating a good habit. It's a form of, of course, um, a little more extensive than that, but it is indeed part of the element. Can we create good habits in order to support our well being? Yes, indeed, you can. So it is my work uh, through all these 10 weeks that I'm going to see you to facilitate that. I'm going to use all my tools, all my resources, my entire presence to support that development of uh, the development of those skills, or when they have it the enhancement of those skills. Um, you are so welcome. So that's um, a, a very short five-stage counseling session process that will allow us to carry on a session um, and, and it will allow us to facilitate one. Of course, you know, like I say, I thought about this presentation as if it was the first one. Don't forget that um, 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 identifying the strengths or goal setting or, or the noticing the retelling of its story or even the action 
will take time. They don't develop, I mean, in one session, of course, but it is kind of a way of floating that first session. I want to hear your story. We are relating, connecting right now. I can begin shut it down in my notebook goals. I can hear if after the session uh, with some of my words or sentences, there is some uh, gaining of awareness. And I can, you know, later on, I will measure my act, the action, the actionating of your change later on. So I'm going to open up the floor now for questions, comments, and anything else you want to share with us. Indeed, Felicia, you are totally right. Affirmations are always, it has, to, it's, it has the same function. Mm -hmm. And affirmations should be genuine. So uh, one of the things I hear my some colleagues do is what I call cheerleading. They'll say, "Oh, you're amazing! That's so that's perfect! That is wonderful!" And it's like, is it really, or is it? You know, can we be more accurate in what we mean? Oh, that's great! It's it's a notice, noticeable improvement from how you were kind of viewing yourself from last week, where everything kind of seemed you know, impossible to you. So being uh, articulating a, a realistic perspective rather than these over the top, uh, what are I, exaggerations, you know, when people say perfect because they got a glass of water at the restaurant, I'm like, I, I'm not, in, I'm not on board. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's kind of a miracle that water exists at all, but we're not getting to that kind of philosophical uh, point of view yet. Uh, Terry, uh, if, it, if, if you find that the sessions are just chit chat, would you, as a therapist, end this counseling relationship? A uh, beautiful question. Um, it, it's profound because truly you will need to look into what's happening. Is it happening to you or is it happening to the client? Or are you not truly seeing what the client is gaining? Meaning it could be that the chit chatting allows the client to reflect and goes home and becomes constructive and the change begin manifested. Mm -hmm. Will I do it? Um, I'm uh, personally as a professional and a therapist, I, I will never end a relationship just because my client comes and she chat with me. Um, would I do it after three years? Of course, I will be like, okay, I, th I don't think I have anything else to offer you. Um, but that's just coming from, from me that I, I you know, I, have work a lot on myself and see, you know, um, have work on my skills as a therapist and things like that. But I will not end it immediately. What would you say, uh, Oscar? Yeah, it's, you know, I would be hard pressed to find a situation where I didn't think there was a therapeutic benefit to it. Because even if we're just building rapport, and um, now if, if it's, if it's, there's lots of ways to look at this. If it's personal, pressing into like a personal interpersonal relationship, like they want to be my friend or they're coming for that kind of thing. And I might notice that. And I would challenge that say, you know, it seems like most of the time what you come here to do is just to like have, you know, a, a conversation and spend time. And while there is value in that, I think met maybe a better way is that you increase your social support, go out and find friends, people that you, you have uh, interest with and develop those strong personal connection because while I care about you and I'm compassionate towards you and the things that you go through as, a, as an individual I am not here to be your friend um, and I, I, I can't I can't be friends with all my clients you know uh, I have my own friends you know and sometimes uh, clients want that they're like well you're great because it's kind of like an easy you know uh, uh, instant friend you know like oh they, this person's right here they already know everything about me but I'm thinking um me as a therapist and me as an individual are kind of different and our value, my values are while they are, they lie, they're not going to mesh that well. And I've got my own, you know, my own life. And, uh, and of course, um, Terry, once again, it's uh, in a very independent case by case. Um, <laughs> So um, that doesn't remove your, your professional responsibility to support the client. If it truly the client is just going to see you because he wants to date you or she wants to date you, of course, it's your responsibility to be noticed in that and immediately referred out for sure. Um, 
I just happened that in, in, in my time as a therapist, I haven't encountered that need yet. So um, there. Yeah, and it takes a lot of effort to come to therapy, you know, set time in your schedule. So people would tend not to do that. Um, and if if they are overly uh, dependent on the therapeutic relationship, you'll notice that early on, probably, and, and set some firm boundaries. Absolutely. Any other questions, folks, that I may be able to share some of my experience? Yeah, great presentation, Ardo. I, I, I was reflecting, I was thinking, I didn't have such a clear understanding of the therapeutic you know, process delivered to me while I was in graduate school. So hearing it again, and then kind of revisiting it in my own mind with the information I know of, being an actual therapist for a number of years, it, I thought this would be really helpful to have. And these models, as you mentioned, are models. They're not what we call real life, but they do help to clarify um, stages of counseling, understanding where I'm at, you know, like maybe I need to move on to this stage. And they're fluid too. We, we show things in, in, in this order in time, but it doesn't, it, sometimes it just kind of bounces around and that's okay too. But if you just have pure chaos in your session and there is no flow to it, and you probably have conversation with people like this, sometimes you're like, I, I don't know what's going on here, <laughs> you know? Uh, it, yeah, the visualizations, the visuals are really helpful. Then, then there's no co coherence. There's no understanding on either side, and and we are helping clients too to develop better social awareness, uh, develop their interpersonal skills. They will start to mirror your empathic um, behavior, and 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 that's a really cool thing when you think about it. Because if I show them compassion, like it's like a it, it catches right and then they go out into the world and start sharing compassion and this is this is this kind of exponential factor that we can do by helping one person this is probably one of the reasons i like teaching so much and training new professionals is because i thought i can't make enough of a difference as one person but as uh semester by semester year by year goes by and graduating class comes and goes i think wow how many folks are they going to impact and i could be a part of that and um, there's a lot of personal and professional satisfaction that goes into that. And, and as a therapist, I'm like, I'm doing my part, but I'm also helping in that other, the other way. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, it's, it's Absolutely. And I just wanted to, um, before we go guys, uh, to let you know that once again, as Mr. Cita said, this is just a, a framework, a model, a, a way of seeing it. So as you continue developing your skills, you may initiate the session like, okay, tell me the problem, what kind of thing. So um, it's just, um, um, you, uh, uh, no, you do not, as a matter of fact, it will be just blue, blue, blue. All right. The keyboard, okay? Blue, blue, blue. I'll put it in the chat too. Thank you. Thank you, Livy, for reminding me. Um, that's all. And I keep reminding myself about adding the slides so that I can put the keyboard, <laughs> but I keep forgetting. So oh, yeah. <laughs> so as a reminder, for those of you that have maybe have not been to a symposium before, in your assignments uh, of the symposium, you'll, you'll put the password in and submit that as your assignment. Mm -hmm. You don't have to write a paper. Sometimes people do both. It's one or the other. If you come to the symposium live, you just give us the password and then we give you the grade for participating. If you weren't able to make it, we also we upload the, the lecture and um, give you the link, and then you write a, a two to three page summary. Um, so that's just kind of uh, the way that everybody can can participate, even if they can't make it at this time. Um, but we're we're glad to see so many people tonight uh, make it, and even some other instructors showed up. So that's kind of cool. So Veronese, um, I, I will be in the room one. So Mr. Sida will be in both. Graduations? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, graduation. Thanks for mentioning that. Okay. Um, graduation in Perump will be, I I think, on Wednesday the 15th. Um, Gerardo and I will both be there along with Dean, Dr. Dean Dinelli. She's going to be in lots of them. And um, and then I will be in Elko's graduation. So, I'd love to see any of you. Um, we are having a pinning ceremony for 
Crump graduates, uh, I'll be up there for that. If when I see you um, for graduation, I'm sorry, in Elko, uh, when I see you down here in Crump, I'll have a pin for those folks that are um, for, that are graduating. Absolutely. Yeah. So Kim's uh, it's at the 14th at 10 a.m. for Crump, mm -hmm. and uh, let's see, and then the following Saturday, the 20th. 21st, I believe. Yeah, the 21st, it's in Elko at 10 a.m. Pinning ceremony is on Friday the 20th at 5 o'clock, I think. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're look, really looking forward to it. Everybody is because we haven't had a graduation for a couple of years. Um, and we are probably having our large, largest graduating class from our bachelors this year. I think it's, we've got four graduates. Unfortunately, David's in, uh, not in Nevada, but we'll, we'll be we with you in spirit uh, absolutely absolutely well you guys have a beautiful rest of your night do some self-care and uh we will continue working we are almost there the semester is almost over all right everyone have a great night yeah Elko penny is five o'clock on the 20th that's friday you should have been, you received an invitation, if not call the department, and they can provide you with the details. Uh, don't forget the password last time, because some people email me, I know I was there. It's blue, 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 blue three times, okay? There you go. Thanks Thank for you. a great lecture, Gerardo. Really appreciate it. And thanks Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your time. Have a wonderful Thank night, you. everyone. Good night.